Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mike Nesmith. And on my left is the delightful and charming personality, David Jones. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. No sweat. <laughs> and on my left is the charming and delightful Peter Tor. Thank you, David. And on my charming and delightful is the left moderator, <laughs> Nikki Dolenz. Thank you, my charming panel. Here we come, walking down the street. Get the funniest looks from everyone we meet. Hey, hey, we're the monkeys, and people say we monkey around. But we're too busy singing to put anybody down. We're just trying to be friendly. I'll come and watch you sing and play. We're the young generation, and we got something to say. Was it a TV show? Was it a rock and roll group? I don't have any idea. I don't know. It was, it was neither, and it was a little of both. It was a TV recording, touring, merchandising project. We became four musicians and four actors. Instead of two and two, we became actors and musicians. And it crossed over and it complemented each other. It's like Leonard Nimoy really becoming a Vulcan. And that's what happened. And we became this band. And that's the amazing story, I think, behind the monkeys. Hey, hey, mercy woman, plays a song and no one listens. I need help, I'm falling again. Play the drum a little bit louder, tell me I can live without her. If I only listen to the band, listen to the band. I got a call from uh, Bert Schneider and Bob Rabelson. And basically, they said, look, we want to do a show that's sort of an American kind of Beatles. The thought was that a show that incorporated pop music and this, what it then was, this radical new style of filmmaking um, would be innovative. <laughs> We just try to make them four, were there four monkeys? Yeah. Four footloose, you know, improvisational, zany guys. Here we go, walking down, down the street. street. We had the funniest looks from everyone we meet. No, 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 no. Would this have been a hit had they been called, uh, you know, the Artvarks? Probably. I said, that's the most stupid name I've ever heard. The, that's your first mistake. The other mistake is not getting guys who are like in a band already. <laughs> Basically, they decided what they would do was have an open audition. So they put the madness thing, you know, madness actors wanting to take part in the TV show, Ben Frank types. And as we all know, Ben Frank's is a restaurant on Sunset. It's a late night place. You can go there and get your eggs and bacon, you know, you know, after you've been out on the razzle or whatever. And um, 
So um, Ben Frank types were long-haired sort of beatnik weirdos from the 60s. Oh, the auditions, yeah, were very extensive. I mean, they were uh, weeks and weeks, I seem to remember, of singing and, and moving and, and acting and improvisation and playing an instrument. I played guitar at the time. The four we chose were the ones that we all liked the best. My name is David Jones. <laughs> My name is David Jones. <laughs> My name is David Jones. <laughs> Will the real David Jones please stand up? I am standing up. I was born in Manchester, England, um, an industrial town. I was uh, raised in Manchester till the time I was 14 years old, and then I moved to Newmarket to become an apprentice jockey, riding racehorses. It didn't work out because the agents took me up to London one weekend and I auditioned for the part of the Artful Dodger and I got the role. David was appearing on Broadway in Oliver. Screen Gems got hold of me and they decided that they wanted to find a vehicle for me. I came to California with Ward Sylvester. We were going to establish a solo career for him. I've offered you my Love and Spoonful collection, my Bobby Dylan records, my Blind Lemon Jefferson records, and this prize of my collection, Bobby Darren Sings His Bank Book. Throw in the stones. Okay. <laughs> Let me see that. Davy Jones Sings. And then the monkey thing started to develop and I was just perfect for that, you know, that was sort of like rock and roll, so they finally find a vehicle. When they were going through all the screen tests that they had, they started calling me the guy with the wool hat. I said, yeah, well, bring wool hat back. Let's see wool hat again. This is H.L. Nesmith. He owns a small spread in southern Texas. Uh, but what's the name of the ranch again, Mr. Nesmith? Uh, Houston. <laughs> I was born and raised in Texas, ordinary growing up. Stayed there until I was 20, and then I moved to to Los Angeles. Here he is, Michael Blessing. Let's hear it from Michael Blessing. I chose the name Blessing out of the telephone book, and uh, I didn't find anything in the A's that I liked. I am not a dream. I am not an angel. I am just a man. You're not a queen, you're just a woman Hold my hand We'll make a space in the lives we both had planned And here we'll stay until it's time for you to go I used to chuck class and take a chair and go and sit in the middle of the stage <laughs> and look and look out at this empty house and just play like it was full of people screaming and uh, you know, I kept thinking to myself someday someday so I was sitting in the office auditioning waiting for the audition the monkeys audition and Mike came in and said hello Pete <laughs> ladies and gentlemen the dove the bird of peace I have placed the bird in the bag I'm going to make the bird disappear I blow up the bag. <laughs> well, I believe my parents when they tell me that I was born in Washington, D.C., February 13th, 1942. Yeah, I flunked out of college for the second time. And uh, my father said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I think I'll go to New York to seek my fame and fortune. I didn't find it there. There wasn't any there. I came to L.A. in 1965. And then I played piano for Steve Stills and Ron Long, who were called the Buffalo Fish. Uh, Steve was my buddy from the village. We had known each other 
We were the kids who looked alike. A Steve called and said, Peter, I've just met this guy who is doing a TV show based on a hard day's night. And you should come up and try out. I went, yeah, yeah. I'd been up for like three or four shows that month. I don't like it, painted red. <laughs> Take a memo. Going into production for my new film, the first 10 days of Pompeii. Have the ad read. You've read the book. Now see the movie. <laughs> M.D. Somebody write a book called The First 10 Days of Pompeii. Well, I was born here in Los Angeles and uh, grew up in a show business family. And then the, uh, the first series I had was Circus Boy when I was 10. I rode an elephant around for three or four years. Life isn't just one big circus, Corky. Maybe it'd be better if it was. I understand that there was a cattle call, kind of a, a call went out, you know, in the trades. But of course, I'd already had a series, so I had a, a private audition. One didn't go to cattle calls, you know, when one already had one's series. The first interview was very unusual. I walked into this office and there was pizza cartons everywhere and Coke cans and just, and these two guys sitting around in jeans and t-shirts and I thought they were like the guys that brought in the pizza and they were the producers and so that was a, a big difference, you know, for someone like myself who'd been to a lot of auditions in Hollywood and television companies, it was usually some big guy in a suit and a cigar going, yeah, kid, well, tell me a little about your background. I even remember the time I thought, I really want this one, <laughs> this is, this is kind of cool. Oh, everybody seemed perfectly swell. Mike struck me as an incredibly witty, very, very funny um, humorist. And Mark Nesmith walked in there, and he had a bag of laundry over his shoulder. He had his pants tucked into his boots, which came up just, you know, to about his knee. You know, and he had his wool hat on, you know. It was the middle of summer. I thought, this guy's just come out of the mountains. What's going on here? So he came in, and he walked in to the says, Well, I don't have much time, he said. How long is this going to take? <laughs> and uh, I thought, my God, we got a rare one here. Peter um, uh, was my entree into the world of Bohemia. Peter was in another world, the waterbeds, brown rice, Harry Krishna. It was scary. Davy Jones walked through like he owned the place. <laughs> But I've grown to love him now. I do. I actually do love him. This was finding three brothers I never had. And this is Mike Nesmith, Mickey Dolans, and Peter Tong, and Davy Jones, and Mickey Dolans, reminding you to save the Texas prairie chicken. Here we come, walking down the street. We get the funniest looks from everyone we meet. So all of a sudden, I was put with these other three boys. I didn't want to analyze them. I just wanted to do the job. I was playing the part of a, a rock and roll singer in a TV series. He's in love. Yeah, for the very first time today. Tell me, Mr. Jones, what do you look for in a girl? Well, um, it all depends what I've lost. <laughs> David can be the short one. <laughs> oh, I got that part, did I? You are too short. You are too short, and you have no ear for music. Oh, oh, fine. Ah, who's this bearded weirdo? <laughs> With malice towards none, and charity for all. Very nice, very nice indeed, but he doesn't have the looks. Well, how about if we shave him? No, it wouldn't help, it wouldn't help. <laughs> That's it. That's perfect. Hmm, that little wave of hair, and the little green hat sitting casually cocked on his head. Mike was kind of a Will Rogers kind of a character. A jug of bread, a loaf of wine, and thou beside me in the wilderness. Oh, Peter, you've quoted the most beautiful poetry I've ever heard. Does that mean we can go out together tonight? No. Why not? Let's face it, man, you're a sissy. <laughs> well, this, well, I was just me, the hero, the dummy. <laughs> No, Peter. <laughs> no, Peter. Yes, Peter. 
Peter had actually had, had the toughest acting job because the character that Peter plays on the show is nothing like really he is in real life. What I want to tell you about, over here camera, I want to tell you about my family now. Now take my wife, please take my wife. Oh, my wife. She talked so much, I sent her to Florida last week, she came back with a burnt tongue. As a video comedic group, it was Mickey who could go nuts and who could trip out and who could deliver the lines. They also have insufferable torches here on Earth. Whenever a pussycat cries, they tear off its head. Definitely not. Then they holler in its ear. Right. And then they put the head back on the body. I don't know how it stays alive. Uh, Mickey could be the funny one, because he's funny. He looks funny. I'm not acting strange. I'm acting perfectly normal. There's nothing strange about me. <laughs> don't tear off that cat's head again. I can't stand it. Ever heard of a drummer singing? You know what I mean? The drummer, the drummer can't sing. Mickey got the drummer's part because um, they asked for a volunteer, and Mike, Peter, and myself took one step back, you know, and there was, ah, oh, I guess you're the drummer. Mary, Mary, where are you going to? And Larry Tucker and I are in the pilot. We open the show. It's pretty funny if I say so myself. Dr. Turner, recently in our fair city, there have been many acts of violence committed right in the streets in full view of people like yourself. Disgusting. They have just stood by and watched people being brutally attacked. Deplorable. What would, how do you feel about that, sir? Disgusting. It's each man's solemn duty to protect his fellow citizens. And if you saw a fight or a person being beaten taking place right here in I the would involve myself physically. I would come in fists and feet flying. I would give them my I'll tell you something right now. Some innocent bystander, please help me. How about you, sir? It was done in the quick cut, Richard Lester style, very in your face. Standards and practices said you had to have parents there. So I think under duress, uh, Bob and Bert had put in a manager in your pilot originally. We had this manager who ran a record store. Well, Hat, take the boys right over to the Riviera Country Club. You're going to audition for a Mr. Russell. Hey, you're putting us on. Nope. Oh, really? That's just great. Thanks, Rudy. And the pilot tested very badly, I understand, when it first went out. It really was a disaster. It may have been the lowest rated uh, pilot they had ever tested. So, Rafelson's listening to the focus groups and they're getting the guys mixed up. They're saying Mickey when they mean Davey. Rafelson said, well, you know, the problem is they don't know who these guys are. I learned who they were from their screen tests. All right, let me ask you something. I mean, like, do you make a folk sound or a rock sound or anything like that? I make a terrible sound. <laughs> hey, let me see no. do the song and dance you do. Song and dance you do? song and dance do? Do something quick. A song and, you must be joking. No, I'm not. What do, you want, what do you want me to do? I'll dance one of your little quick things. Okay. Hey, Davey, you want to know something? Honestly, hold on for a second. What? I really think you should have been a jockey. <laughs> Mike, let me ask you something. Do you think you can play another part? A part I'm of another guy? What is that? What do you want me to be? Strong and silent? Yeah, be strong and silent. Hey, well, well I'll be a girl. <laughs> Mike did the same thing. Well, I mean, that's your hang-up, man. <laughs> not mine. I mean, I know where it's at. Were you ever a strong and silent girl before? <laughs> Have you ever had that? And Bob brought it back in and re-edited it and put in the interviews and took out the manager. And the rating went off the... Uh, went, went through the roof. That worked. It sold. <laughs> Once upon a time in the land of Kirshner... My job basically was to pick the songs uh, get a song in each show and I became the supervisor of the music, the albums, and I had creative control on the entire project. He was the guy that put songs in TV shows and movies and that, uh, you get to, came to him. He had them, the Carol Kings and the Neil Diamonds and the Sadakas and the Nielsens and Carol Bear Sega, Barry Mann, Cynthia Wilde, Lieber and Stoller, you know, Sears and Roebuck, you know, Neiman Marcus. He had them all under contract, you know. Uh, the first song we did with Last Train at Clarksville 
which was really a departure, but I felt with the train sound that Tommy Boys and Bobby Hart wrote for me and the promotion we had, it would be number one. It was a very smart idea to combine the visual uh, a sitcom with a group that could sell records. And uh, of course the songs were a big part of it. And I think that having the Nevins Kirshner music stable of writers was just uh, a wonderful part of the monkey's success. I thought Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart had a, a great collection of um, material, all different kinds of songs. And I, I really think, you know, they were the best for the monkeys. Take the last train to Foxville and I'll meet you at the station. You can be here by 4.30 cause I've made your reservation very slow. Oh, no, no, oh, no, no, And I don't know if I'm ever coming home. Mickey Dolans and I were sitting outside our house in Beverly Glen and all of a sudden, last train to Clarksville came on. We just went, yeah, you know, almost jumped through the roof, you know, and it wasn't even a convertible. So we went, wow, it's incredible. Oh, God, this is it. We're hugging each other, you know. I think the song Last Train to Clarksville was number one before the show hit the air. And then they proceeded to argue, you know, what was making it. The records making the TV, the TV making the records. The idea was that the success of the record would drive viewership to the first episode. Man, they're the most. Man, they're the monkey. Take the wildest ride of your life with the world's zaniest string quartet. Swing with the monkey at 7.30, 6.30 Central Time. The Monkees was a television show about a group like the Beatles. We used to make fun of other groups and of the Beatles and throw darts at, at Beatle posters like because of the supposed jealousy. There was about four guys that lived in a house in Malibu Beach and they're four guys with no father figure, no authority, except occasionally Mr. Babbitt would come in and say, you know, your rent's due. I am kicking you out! Hey, what's the matter? We paid the rent the 1st of September. Yeah, but that was for July! <laughs> And the show very nearly didn't get on television because it was so out there and so alternative. I mean, believe it or not, that, you know, long hair at that time was still synonymous with crimes against nature. So here come the monkeys, just fun-loving guys, and the little kids go, look, mommy, they have long hair and they don't do horrible, nasty things. Wait! What? What? What is it? A brilliant idea. Well? That's what we need, a brilliant idea. Well, where are we going to get that? I've got it. We've got to talk to the writers. <laughs> Hi, fellas. Listen, uh, we need an idea for the show, you know. Got to be something fast and groovy and hip and everything, you know. Can you do it? <laughs> the guys who wrote the stuff in, in the early days, they wrote a lot of very conventional kind of comedies. And then they turned us loose on them. We had to go and spend a night in a haunted castle, or we had to spend a night in a working in a restaurant or whatever it took to do it to pay the rent. A toy factory needs unskilled help in an unessential job requiring no training or no experience. Hey, Peter. I apply for a job, or the Peter Tork character, There's, there is some difference here, applies for a job and is interviewed by a machine. Your name, please. What? Thank you. Last name, Watt. And your first name, Mr. Watt. No, it's not Watt. Not what? Mr. Not what what? First of all, you've got my name wrong. Correction, name misspelled. Please give correct letter. Well, I... Correct letter is I. Name is not not what, but nitwit. <laughs> oh, bro. Brother is also a nitwit. Now, just a minute. That will do, nitwit. Test complete. Interview ended. Application rejected. <laughs> I like that whole 
You know, so I'm sort of like a romanticist, you know. I, I like the idea of that, you know, the swashbuckling one, you know, where I'm fencing on the table, you know, and doing all that. You know, I see myself as sort of like a pirate, Errol Flynn type. Guys, listen, guys. We know who you are, so don't try to deny it. We also know where you live, or else how could we have sent this letter? We're coming to get you, so don't leave. This is a threatening letter and a warning. Unless you return the microfilm and get off, the ranch will kill you. Don't, don't worry, worry about it, Peter. There's nothing in the world go wrong. Ah! All right, give me the microfilm. Wait a minute. Wait, oh, guys. guys, wait a minute. Wait, guys, wait, guys you, you have to do the scare. The old, the old monkey, the old anymore. monkey scare. The, the scare is very funny. Try the scare. You know, you go. Mm. Ah! That bit. Okay, one more time. Well, Jim had an awful lot to do with with uh, what the monkeys were on television. Jim encouraged us to loosen up, to improvise with each other, and he gave us the room to really trust our instincts. The whole show was set up in a way so that we could go crazy and run around. But it was disciplined enough so that we didn't lose sight of the story. The result was an innovative mixture of music and comedy that was totally new to television. I think one of the successes of the show was the fact that the comedy was not topical and not satirical. And I think they worked at that pretty hard. They wanted to make it timeless. The Monkees was the Marx Brothers, basically, with music. <laughs> Monkey Men! Hop, hop and away! One of the highlights of each episode was the rump. Sort of a silent movie comedy cut to whatever song we were plugging that week. This is where we really had an opportunity to cut loose and show off our improvisational skills. You're trying to make your mark in society. You're using all the tricks that you used on me. You're reading all them high fashion magazines. The clothes you're wearing, girl, are causing public scenes. I said, I, I'm not just stepping stone. And then, our most recent hit. I felt that if I could have Mickey Dolenz sing to every girl in America, I saw your face and I'm a believer, it would be a number one smash. I thought love was only true in fairy tales. And for someone else, but not for me. Our love was out to get me. Now that's the way it seemed. Disappointment haunted all my dreams. Then I saw her face. Now I'm a believer. Now her trace put out in my mind. Love was more or less a given thing. 
what I remember about Mickey singing I'm a Believer was how his quality of his voice and the way he sings was different. He brings an acting ability. When I needed sunshine, I got rain. Oh, then I saw her face. Now I'm a believer. Not a trace. A doubt in my mind. I'm in love. I'm a believer. I couldn't leave her if I tried. It's a song. Well, the TV show never got great ratings, which surprised me. It was the records that were really the big, big hit and got most of the notoriety. What was making it work was the size of the machine, of the marketing. It's the whole scene when you splash on Yardley Black Label, the new aftershave that's really out of sight. Be the guy who's got it, got it all. Black Label, get it. Cornflakes, okay, but men's cologne. <laughs> it was too intense. The days was filled with being a monkey. Time or anywhere. Just look over Go, the Go away, will you please? Uh, where's the discharge? Yeah. Ah! It was inconvenient to go out. In Hollywood, the winner is the monkey. To the monkeys who uh, really won the award. Thank you. Yeah, with the monkeys. The people say we monkey around. But we're too busy singing. Put down. So it's hard to believe Davey seems to have time for everyone and time to do everything. He's just plain fantastic. But not as great as this guy. <laughs> Mike's the quiet monkey with the drawly, groovy voice. And you have to understand, if you get caught, it's not like you're a human being anymore. It's like you're a souvenir. And they don't care what party they're going to take home. They're going to take home some party. And it's not just clothing we're talking about either. We're talking about eyes and wisdom teeth and whatever they can rip so off. Peter stated it real well. Your life when you go out on the road turns into an endless tunnel of just limousines and airplanes and hotel rooms. And then all of a sudden there's one brief period of light and that's when you walk out there on the stage.
you, you really found out that none of us could play a note and couldn't carry a tune in the bucket. Would you hate us? No. No? Why, why is that? Well, because you're putting people on pretty good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We were backstage, and it's like two minutes before we were supposed to go on. And this guy walks up, and he's got a, he's a reporter, you know, like that. And he goes, I'm standing with my guitar over my back. This thing, and he walks up, and he says, is it true that you don't play your own instruments? I said, wait a minute, I'm fixing to walk out there in front of 15,000 people, man. If I don't play my own instruments, I'm in a lot of trouble. When that whole monkeys is the prefab, don't play their own instruments controversy blew up, which was pretty big noise for a while. Uh, what we got from all of the young pop rock wannabe, would-be musicians was that the monkeys had no right to be where they were as far as their music went. They just, they, the studio musicians made their music, they didn't write it, they didn't perform it, they just, somebody, one of them saying, it doesn't count, it's not real, it's bogus. It didn't matter if it was the Monkees or Elvis Presley or Frank Sinatra, everybody cut the same way in those days. There was always, uh, studio musicians would go in and do the tracks and the lead singer would come in. Nobody played their home music. The mamas and the papas didn't play their own music, they had people playing it. I was guilty because we were fake, I thought. I actually think that people believed there actually was this that, like Laverne and Shirley, the monkeys actually all like lived in some house on Laurel Canyon or something, and and hung out together and and like wrote songs together. Um, one, two, three, four. Da 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 that's terrible. That's the worst thing. Thanks very much, fellas. We wanted to be the musicians in the studio. That's all we asked for. Kirshner, whose idea of control was everything in place, saw this as the barbarians at the gates of the Holy Roman Empire. And he wasn't having any of it. And he also said, you know, you guys have got to sing and you've got to play like we say to do it. Just get a grip, pal. He, this is not an enforceable covenant. And the order came to Kirshner. The next single must have the lads themselves, the boys themselves, being the studio musicians on the B-side. So Donnie put out a record where professional studio musicians had done both sides, released the record in Canada only. Fired him. Bam. Just like that. They didn't like it. And so the easy way they thought they would get rid of me at the time was by firing me. Only time I ever got fired. And we uh, did manage at that point to uh, wrest the control of the records and what was going to be released and what was going to be recorded and all that. We managed to totally control that from then on and record sales plummeted. <laughs> but we didn't care because we were doing what we wanted to do. Burning from the rising heat, the fern, a place to hide. The grass is always greener growing on the other side in no time. another organization that was set up to make their records and suddenly we're being rebels here and having to do it all for ourselves and, and do something real and so it, it was scary. And we were determined to play every little stinking note on every little track. It wasn't until headquarters came out that there was really a basis for the monkeys' music, and then it, it went on from there, and and it and it did better and better. I thought. Just a loudmouth Yankee, I went down to Mexico. I didn't have much time to spend about a week or so. 
There I lightly took advantage of a girl who loved me so But I found myself thinking when the time had come to go What am I doing hanging round? I should be on that train and gone I should be riding on that train to San Antonio. What am I doing hanging around? Pleasant Valley Sunday is probably my favorite of all the monkey tunes uh, on the whole. Uh, it just had everything going for it. Pleasant Valley Sunday I first heard as a wonderful demo by Carol King, and I felt it needed an intro, so I kind of made this thing up that went with it, which I. I taught that to Mike Nesmith. The local rock group down the street is trying hard to learn their song. Serenade the weekend squire just came out to mow his lawn. Another Pleasant Valley Sunday. Charcoal burning everywhere. Make it hard for me to see My thoughts all seem to stray To places far away I need a change of scenery For the benefit of the three people in the audience who don't know what it's all about, it's about the monkeys. Four young men who flew into London to perform in this country for the first time. Mickey, Davy, Peter and Mike. Just arrived from Paris. The people say we monkey around. We're too busy singing. To put down. Seems reminiscent of Beatlemania. Thousands of kids going crazy to get near them. I think they've all gone monkey nuts. We asked them if they take drugs. Not yet. Coffee. Not yet. I drink coffee. That's about the worst drug that I take. I took aspirin once. We destroyed drink, uh, my head and it provided me with a lot of inspiration too. I'm going to write a song in the next uh, call. I, uh, I have a real problem that uh, I get high on one a day vitamins. You know, so anything That'll else really wastes me. I drink uh, uh, chlorine with a Drano back. x lax does it to me. Randy Skaskit was a song I wrote in England when I was there on tour. And it was quite simply about my experiences there. She's a wonderful lady and she's mine, all mine. And there doesn't seem a way that she won't come and lose my mind. It's too easy humming songs to a girl in the yellow dress. It's been a long time since the party and the room is in a mess. 
The four kings of EMI are sitting stately on the floor There are birds out on the sidewalk and a ballet at the door He reminds me of a penguin with few and plaster hair There's talcum powder on the letter and the birthday boy is there Why don't you cut your hair? Just free association, a song I was just kicking around. References to the woman that was going to become my first wife, Samantha. References to the Beatles. You know, the Beatles liked them a lot. They were I mean, very warm. I mean, they were very warm guys. And still are, some of them. And uh, somebody set up for me to meet Paul McCartney, and that was going to be the big monkey beetle meeting. You know, monkey meets beetle. And I brought an autograph book. I was just like, we just had a great chat, and I was thrilled. Well, I was told that John Lennon said, the monkeys are nothing like the Beatles. They're more like the Marx Brothers. Which was right, we were. They admired us very much for the, the, you know, the ability to go into the studio and make television day in and day out. And he walks on stage and he starts playing the guitar with his teeth. And I said, hey, that's the guy that plays the guitar with his teeth. And just simultaneously, by coincidence, we needed an opening act for the tour. He was opening in front of us, and of course, you know, he walked in to the beast. He walked into, there, was, there were the waving pink arms, you know, 20,000 pink waving arms, like this. So every time he would say, Foxy, so everybody would go, David, Foxy, David. Oh, man, it was, it was, it was some seriously twisted moment. <laughs> So he went, ah, what's the point? He did about eight concerts with us, and at Forest Hill Stadium, he just like took his guitar off, he got hold of the end of it, and he threw it at the audience. We came back after this, after the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and Life on the Road, being incredible pop stars. Now we're on Gower and Sunset at six o'clock in the morning, sober, you know, trying to be funny, and our heads were in the clouds. Everybody's in position. Boys in position. Boys, you can be in position already. Already in position. <laughs> right, you're in position. Yes. In and position. Hello. 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 Oh, wait, the monkey. I hate these kids. So they couldn't have controlled us if they want to. It was just, oh, hey, camera. Hi, camera. Oh, whoa. If we started laughing sometimes and we'd be laughing until 10 o'clock, they'd have to close the set down. That's it. In 12 hours, you forgot how to talk. I mean, anybody can forget how to talk in 12 hours. Well, then it's simple. All we do is teach them to talk. How? What did you say? <laughs> how? Because we were, we were uh, full of ourselves, no question about it. You know, who wouldn't be? Hello. I'm Mike Nesmith, and I'm one of the monkeys. Tonight, as my guest on this wonderful television program, which has done so much for all of you young people out there, I have as my special guest none other than Frank Zappa. Hi, kids. Hi, Mike. Hi. It's really, it's really a pleasure to be here. It is? <gasps> they have a lot of zany stuff on this program, don't you think? It took the first year for us to get into the swing of what we were doing. That's why I wish that we'd done more shows, more years. Play, Peter. Yes, Peter. I can make you famous. 
If you're gonna rip off, rip off from the best, right? It was uh, Faust. Peter sold his soul to the devil to be able to play the harp. Wait a minute. We really can't stop him if he has a contract. Exactly. That is, if your contract's good. It's legal and valid. Well, I don't think so, and I'm willing to go to court to test it. It was a great episode because it had some pretty good drama behind it. I gave him the ability to play the harp in return for his soul. You know, it was almost worth it. No, you didn't give him the ability to play the harp. Got to be some moment of seriousness or the comedy doesn't play, you know. Okay, go play the harp. Michael, I can't. Look, the power's inside you. Nobody can give it to you. Nobody can take it away. Now go play the harp. Okay, Mike. in some filthy little town. Help! What a bunch of incompetence. Help! Oh, God, Michael was so good in that. He was so good. It really was Michael's finest hour as an actor. <laughs> it's fun. Put on a blonde wig and say, help me! Oh, fair princess, I have loved you from afar low these many moons. May I carry you across the mud? What? You carry me across the mud? <laughs> I'm a princess. You're nothing but a lowly little peasant, a wayward serf, the lowest of the low. So you've heard of me. I will honor your spine with a walk across it. Down, peasant. My spine thanks you. Down. There's a 50 cent toll at the other end. Shut up or I'll have you paid. And to have him as himself over there going, Oh, what a great looking chick! My lady! Harold, you better get this carriage out of the mud! Look at those sideburns cool on body! Cool, cool. I think he should have gotten Emmy for it. La 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 You're not the only girl it's on that was ever enjoyed by any boy. You're not the only choo train that was left out in the rain the day after Santa came. You're not the only charity light that was left in the night and gave up without a fight. You're not the only cuddly tongue that was ever enjoyed by any boy. You're not the kind of girl to tell your mother The kind of company you keep I never told you that to love no other You must have dreamed it in your sleep You're not the only cuddly toy That was ever enjoyed by any boy You're not the only chichi train That was left out in the rain The day after Santa came you're not the only charity light that was left in the night and gave up without a fight. You're not the only cuddly toy that was ever enjoyed by any boy. La 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 And it gelled and it worked and, and it worked for a long time. 
until Mickey wanted to direct and Mike wanted to write all the music and Peter wanted to play on all the records, you know. And I probably was a pain too. You know what, Jim? It's the same on every same show we show. do, man. The yeah, same. It's terrible. It's you the same story and they change it around. We'll Wait see you next week, kids. Yeah, we'll think of something by then. Yeah. When everybody started to want to do everybody else's job, that's when it also like went, you know, the okay, sort of like the deck hands taking over the ship. At some point, I asked Bob uh, if I could direct an episode and he said, yeah, sure. Well, my favorite episode was the Frodo's Caper, a uh, show that Mickey wrote and directed. That's Peter! 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 Peter. Are you the... Look, he looks like that TV has put him in some kind of trance. Don't be silly, that's nothing but a test pattern. Uh, Mike, are you sure it's a test uh, pa pattern? Wait a Mike, are you sure it's a test pattern? Mike! Ah! Oh, wow! Oh, what was that? Man, I don't know, it was... Where is that? A test pattern? It was unbelievable! You're telling me it was unbelievable, and you think that was something. You ought to see what happens after the commercial. It was the last Monkeys episode ever to be aired on the, uh, on the television. Bob and Bert, I think, were fed up with the whole bloody thing and wanted to start making movies. Head. Head. So we all piled up in Mike's limo and met Bob and Bert and Jack at, in Ojai up here in California at a golf resort. And we just sat there for four days rambling in tape recorders. And out of that came the movie Head. When we set out to make Head, the movie, we decided that the last thing we wanted to do was to make a 90-minute monkey episode. As it turned out, it seemed to show the four monkeys trying to escape our manufactured teeny bopper image. It was a surreal and somewhat experimental look at where we fit into the media landscape. producer's way of saying goodbye boys. Get up, lady. You're not dead. Hey, lady, come on. Get up. Stop acting. Hey, what is this? Hey, come on. Stop playing. It's all over. It's an act. Come on. Get up. Well, stop kicking me. Oh, I don't want to do this anymore, man. Oh, these fake arrows and this junk and the fake trees. Bob, I'm through. Oh, stink, man. Hey, well, Mickey, wait a minute. You say we're manufactured. To that, we all agree. So make your choice and we'll rejoice in never being free. Hey, hey, we are the monkeys. We've said it all before. The money's in, we're made of ten. We're here to give you more. The money's in. I don't think head's cynical. There was a darkness to the piece. A darkness to the piece that dealt with the death of a phenomenon. But Rafelson's that kind of a filmmaker. And so is Nicholson to a certain degree. Don't listen to them, Peter. They're wise guys, punks. All they want to do is hurt people and abuse them. How do you feel now? Oh, come see, come see. All right, that's enough. Cut it, print it, please. Right, that should be it. Okay. Yeah. I think we're on the other side. Hey, Bob, that's right. not right, man. Oh, well, yeah, you know about hitting a girl. Over there. Hey, is that all right, man? Does that look good? I thought it looked great. Yeah, but about hitting a woman and everything. Man, it's about the image and everything. It's not right. Part of what Bob was about was not being very charitable to us. Great. I'll have a go at him. You won't hurt my face, will you? Million dollar head, this. Why him, baby? Well, you know, I like him. He looks like a nice guy and I like his smile. Go on, see if you can hit me. Just once. Just once. <laughs> Please don't, please don't. 
It wasn't the movie the monkey should have made at the time. We should have made something like Ghostbusters or a nice fun monkey movie. The promotional campaign for the movie was so, well, it looks like it was calculated to sync the movie. Ed was not advertised as a monkey's film. <laughs> this is not like advertising, it's like a face going, head, head. So if, if they, they wanted to kill the monkeys, if they wanted to kill the movies, the phenomenon, the monkeys project, boy, they, they did a pretty good job. I'm a fully automatic Thirty-three and a third revolutions per monkey was a network TV special we did in 1969. That was really the downslide. Thirty-three and a third revolutions per monkey was uh, just didn't have any heart. That's when Peter quit. Uh, well, bye, Pete. <laughs> Later, Pete. Listen. Don't forget to write, Pete, and uh, remember the door is always open to you, Pete. Uh, you can come home to the pad and all your friends, but write first because we're renting your room. And if in the end we should go both our separate ways, I know the lesson I've learned here is worth it all. Cause now I feel like such a fool for making you crawl back to me. That you're standing far above Me and all I did to you I'm sorry now, what can I do? And then all of a sudden it was sort of like Hey, hey, we're the monkeys <laughs> That was Mickey and I It's like what they say about the Mafia Sooner or later, we all come back Monkey's phenomena is not nostalgic. There is a uh, there's a very current kind of electricity that goes on. Yeah, well, you know, that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? The four of us together. You know, nobody's died in this band. It 
it's all our own music, it's all our own words, it's all our own everything. That's cool! I'd like the monkeys remembered for exactly what it was. A television show about a group and the members of that, the cast, shall we say, the cast of that television show actually did pull it off. It's one of those things that just kind of happens every once in a while and nobody really understands why. And huh, I don't. We did play, we did perform, we did make music, and we've made music recently. It's not like we weren't anything. We weren't nothing, we were something, we weren't nothing. Even now, I hear the songs on the radio, and people say, hey, I heard Daydream Believer on the radio. Hey, I Believe Believer was on the radio. I mean, there must have been some sort of something to it. Oh, I could hide neath the wings of the bluebird as she sings. The six o'clock alarm would never ring. But it rang.
something we 